It's a very special day for us as we welcome the new CEO of ISQA, Dr. Karsten Engel. We have our own leader in healthcare delivery, Dr. Naresh Shetty, to moderate the session and two eminent speakers, Anna Edwards, Isabella Castro, speaking to us about patient experience. I acknowledge the presence and support of the President of the Asian Society for Quality, ASQUA, Dr. Ravindran Jagasothi. As we go through the full-blown pandemic in our country, we as healthcare providers empathize with our patients. It's a disaster of unimaginable proportions, and we believe that this too shall pass. Taho truly appreciates the strength, resilience of the healthcare providers and salute the healthcare professionals in the forefront. I now invite Dr. Anuradha Pichumani, Chairman, Quality Professionals Wing of CAHO, to introduce the guest of honor. Over to you, Dr. Anuradha. Thank you, Dr. Lalu. Good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Karsten Angel, the new CEO of ISQA, to inaugurate today's CAHO ISQA International Webinar. Dr. Karsten has an MD from the University of Copenhagen, with further specialization in anesthesiology. He joined IKAS, the Danish Institute for Quality and Accreditation in Healthcare in 2006, where he helped develop, implement, and manage the National Danish Accreditation Program and was appointed the Deputy Chief Executive in 2010. At ISQA, he has been a member of the Accreditation Council from the year 2010 to 2021, the Deputy Chair since 2016, and an ISQA expert since 2013. He has contributed to the development of ISQA's international accreditation program and is a member of the ISQA Academy of Quality and Safety in Healthcare since 2019. He has extensively published and presented on accreditation related topics. Earlier this week, he assumed the position of Chief Executive Officer of ISQA. I now invite Dr. Carson Angel to share his views. Over to you, sir. Thank you. First, I wish to express my admiration for the tremendous efforts you are doing these days to combat the uh, disaster that's, that's over you. And I only can hope for you that the slight decrease we have seen in numbers in the last few days will signal that, that a turn has, has come. It's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to, pre to be present at this Cow ISCO webinar to say a few words to you on the importance of global cooperation in healthcare quality. In ISQA, we believe that healthcare quality is a universal concept. In view of that, global cooperation is both natural and necessary. But we also acknowledge that while healthcare quality as a concept is universal, the road that leads to quality must be dependent on the context. Healthcare is a complex system, just as the health state of an individual person. This means that there's no recipe, no algorithm that can be passed on and if followed carefully will inevitably lead to the desired goal. Health must be achieved in co-production with the patient and the caregivers. Healthcare quality can't truly really be achieved without active engagement of all staff and of patients too. So cooperation is a key word, cooperation to enable those who are direct deliverers to improve and sustain the quality of the services they are responsible for. The way in which ISQA will contribute to global cooperation can be summarized in three words, knowledge, network, voice. There is a lot of knowledge spread all around the world. We aim to promote and support a series of networks that allows this knowledge to become accessible to those who can benefit from it and thus gives them a voice to call for action and a voice to suggest how the desire for action can be transformed to real action. While doing so, more knowledge is generated in the interaction, initiating a beneficial circle. And today's seminar is an example of this kind of cooperation. Uh, the, the topic is patient experience. And let me just draw your attention to this work has, that has been done by uh, ISQA's person Centered Care uh, ebook working group, where the intention was to write an ebook that will become a go-to resource for anyone wishing to understand person-centered care and its implementation. 
the working group will have a session as at our upcoming conference, virtual conference in July. There will be a special supplement on co-production within our journal. And this follows a co-production learning journey led by Professor Paul Bertolten. We also have uh, some relevant uh, specialists uh, certificates uh, that apply to the, to the um, theme of person-centered care. And with this, I wish you a very fruitful seminar, a webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kastin. We look forward to continuing CAHO's engagement with the SQUA in the times ahead. Moving on to introduce and moderate the sessions scheduled for today's webinar. I would now like to invite Dr. Naresh Shetty. He's an orthopedic surgeon, specialized in trauma and arthroplasty. Dr. Naresh Shetty has been the medical director at MS Ramaya Medical Teaching Hospital and at Ramaya Memorial Hospital. Currently, he is the president for International Program and Strategic Alliance at Ramaya Memorial Hospital. He is the member of Board of Studies in Medical Post-Graduation at Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences and he is a recipient of awards such as the International Youth Exchange Award and the Howe Medica Fellowship from Hong Kong. I invite Dr. Naresh Shetty to introduce the topic and the speakers and moderate the session and take the session forward. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anuradha. Uh, I think uh, we are in a very uh, difficult uh, times in our life. One small virus has taken this world into a total disarray. And as we keep on battling this virus, we are all battered, frustrated by the way things are going across. It is not only one area, but across the world. Each time someone or the other is facing this music. But at this point of time, the worst affected is the patient experience. Because COVID is one place where there is an unemotional management of patient. The patient attendance doesn't see you, the patient sees you in PPE, and the whole experience is something, I think, which all of us are, cannot even think that we could do this uh, kind of an experience. But that's what life is all about. And I think no better time than this to talk about patient experience. And we have two you know, eminent speakers. The first one is Anna Edwards. Anna Edwards herself has gone through a lot of trauma in her life basically going through a medical issues right from her younger days. She was a barrister, but her experience of patients motivated her to take up health and social care in England. After receiving a master degree in health policy from the Imperial College, London, Anna worked for health and patient-centered policies and as a patient representative at the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. Anna Edward is now with the Prime Minister's Cabinet post in the United Kingdom and also is co board member. The other speaker is from South America, Isabella Castro. Isabella is a pediatric uh, dentist by training. She has served in the Brazilian Air Force. She was flying also at some time and in the United Health Group as a specialized dentist and consultant for innovation and patient experience initiative. She has a wide range of experience in public and private healthcare, military hospitals, home care, to expertise in healthcare operation and management. Like with all our speakers, Anna Edwards, Isabella's traumatic personal experience with healthcare motivated her to get involved with quality improvement, risk management, and innovative practice. As a co-chair at the Beryl Institute Global Patient and Family Advisory Board, and as an ISCO board member, Isabella Castro advocates for a better patient experience at the system level. And today, we have two very eminent speakers. Now, both have gone through a personal bitter experience, and now have become the flag bearer for a patient's experience. And I think we'll go to the first speaker, Anna Edwards, and then we go on to Isabella Castro, and then we'll go for the question and answer session. Thank you. It's all for you, Anna Edwards. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, as uh, has already been said, I'm, I'm Anna Edwards. I uh, work with ISQA as a um, 
patient-centered care advisor to the board. And I was asked to take on that role um, due to my experience as a patient and also my experiences as a uh, professional. Um, I've worked as a barrister for 10 years. Uh, I've also worked for the regulator of health and social care in operations and strategy. Um, at the Department of Health, I did a, a period of time in policy, working on personalised healthcare. And I'm currently in the Prime Minister's um, COVID-19 task force in the Cabinet Office in England. Um, today, I'd really like to share my story with you. And perhaps if I can, uh, and if you'll allow me, just give some advice on how to be the best patient and uh, the best patient focused professional. So this is me at the start of my journey. Um, I was probably about six or seven there. Uh, as a child, I had no problems. I was very healthy and happy. Very rarely attended the doctor. Um, in fact, I can't remember, uh, my parents can't remember me ever attending the doctor's surgery. Um, so a very happy childhood. Um, over um, the course of my kind of early years, I, like many others, um, thought about what I'd like to do with my career. Um, initially, I wanted to be an actress, but my mother um, said that was not an appropriate career path. And so I suggested perhaps a barrister might be better, which she was much happier about. Um, but one thing I definitely wanted to do um, when I was about 16 or 17, I was quite clear I really wanted to travel the world. And very luckily, I've been able to, um, to do that. However, um, as I started my uh, career as a barrister, I went off to university uh, at the University of Manchester, which you can see there on the left. But a few weeks in, um, I ended up in the hospital uh, having surgery for um, a Bartholin abscess. Um, it was considered at that point that this was just a really straightforward gynecological problem that would be easily solved but it absolutely wasn't. And it took some weeks um, to diagnose me with Crohn's disease. In that time, as a patient, and I was 19 years old, I was pretty frightened. I felt a little bit judged because I'd originally been admitted for a gynecological issue. I felt very undermined. I felt like I had no real voice. I had no diagnosis for some time. And then when I did get a diagnosis, I was told it would be a mild inconvenience. So remember those two words, please, a mild inconvenience. It, it felt very much um, top right hand corner um, there, like the doctor was kind of thinking about what, what was wrong with me, he was doing lots of tests and things. Um, but I was kind of thinking, you know, what does this mean for me? Who am I? Who am I going to be? What does it mean for my career? Uh, what does it mean for my relationships with people? Um, is it going to have an impact on me and my family and my ability to have a family? Is it going to kill me? You know, I just didn't know anything about it. And it was 20 years ago now. So people didn't really know what Crohn's disease was then. So it was all rather overwhelming. And I was 19 years old, a young woman, um, just really starting out in life. So I guess it, it, for the next 20 years or so, I felt like this. I felt like I was in a boxing ring. I was really determined to fight this illness, whatever it was. But to be honest, I was going to get knocked down time and time again. I, I felt like I needed people on my side, people in my corner. And that not only was my family and friends, but also the healthcare professionals treating me. And why did I feel like this? Because this is what I had ahead of me. I have now had over 30 major surgeries. I've had an awful lot of pain. I've had temporary stomas, permanent stomas. I now have a permanent one. Uh, I've had sepsis uh, more than once. I've had pneumonia. Both my kidneys failed at one point after IVF. Um, fertility surgery. I've had osteoporosis. 
multiple, multiple abscesses and fistulas. I've become uh, resistant to antibiotics due to UTIs. I've suffered infertility, anemia, and an awful lot of psychological distress. And quite frequently, it didn't feel like I did have my clinicians in my corner. This is how it felt an awful lot of the time. Like I was just another patient. I felt like this was all really life changing. I felt misinformed. I felt really unattractive as a woman. I was frightened. I felt stupid. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it gives you an indication of some of the really negative emotions and feelings I had. And I want to talk to you a little bit about spoon theory. So um, it, this is a way of explaining some of these difficulties. It's a theory that was originally created by Christine Misarandino. Um, and she tried to come up with a way to explain to a friend over dinner how lupus made her feel. And she tried using spoons from tables around them as props, um, using them to explain the little things that can actually be huge hurdles for those who struggle with chronic illness or any illness, frankly. So I'm gonna talk you through how my day might be using spoons. So I get up and I get my son up and have breakfast and I lose a spoon. I take my son to nursery, I come home, I make a cup of tea and I sit at my desk. Another spoon's gone. I sit through two meetings, contributing ideas and thoughts. Another spoon's gone. I make lunch and a drink, something healthy and digestible. I lose a spoon. I work on a document maybe for an hour or two, paying attention to detail and adding some content. That's another spoon gone. I present at a meeting and answer questions on the project I lead, lose a spoon. I then take the dog for a walk, that's another spoon. Now I'm getting towards the end of my day and I've only got one spoon left. So I would have loved to have gone to dinner with my husband tonight or go out with my work team for drinks, but I've got some decisions to make and I still have someone to pick up from nursery. So that's my decision made. And when I run out of spoons, I'm often really exhausted or I'm in pain and I can't buy more spoons or pluck them from thin air. I can take one from the next day, but then I start with less spoons tomorrow. Now, healthy people get dozens of spoons and I might only get five or I might get nine and people with other conditions might only get four. The purpose of this metaphor is not to give a lecture on the finer points of cutlery, but to let you know that having a chronic illness that others can't see is about making difficult decisions every day about what you can get done without wanting to offend anyone or seem less of a team player. And people like me constantly consider how to use our spoons so that we can be the very best we can. So if we can't go for a drink after work or stay for a long time at the, at the, at, at, at the, in the office or stay all day at the staff conference because the amount of spoons we'll use standing all the way home on a peak time train is huge, I would say stick with us, uh, be understanding. Because people with illnesses like me are making difficult choices to feel and stay okay. But I would also say that we're not like that all the time. So um, sometimes we've got more spoons than others. Now, sometimes when all those spoons are gone, it can feel like this. And I have felt like this as a person many, many times. Take you back to that thing I said earlier. I was told my illness would be a mild inconvenience. It really has not been. But what I've done to combat this is learn the system and learn how to get the most out of it. However, the sad truth is that not everyone is able to do that or they might have too few spoons to be able to do it. How many patients have you treated who've just given up because they couldn't navigate their way through the fear, the unknowns and the pain? Now, I'm hugely lucky because it, it I had the most amazing team around me who have managed to get me through so many surgeries. Two of those guys on that page are surgeons at Guys and St. Thomas's in London. Uh, the two on the right are my gastroenterologists. Um, 
And the chap in the middle down the bottom is a, a guy called uh, Aaron Sahai, who saved my life three years ago, um, taking me through complex kidney surgery, which I had to have as a result of early adhesions um, uh, and uh, consequences of having IVF and um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So I'm really lucky because I've got amazing, amazing doctors around me. It hasn't always been like that though, to be fair. Now this is what we might use in, in England. It's an NHS England model on personalized care and it helps to establish a whole population approach to supporting people of all ages and their carers to manage physical and mental health and well-being being, build community resilience and make informed decisions and choices when their health changes. You can see the inputs on the left about specialist care, targeted care and universal care, the types of population you might be looking after with increasing complexity, but also recognition that people move between groups as health changes now. And then finally, on the right hand side, you've got outcomes, which is all about empowering people, supporting them to live well and stay well. But I don't think it's that complicated, actually. Um, this is my thoughts on what patient centred care should look like. You should feel supported. You should feel like you're a contributor, a partner. See here, there's quite a stark difference to that earlier word cloud that I used. But I recognise, having uh, worked in health and social care as a professional for many years, that there are also a number of barriers and enablers. You've got issues with cost and time. You know, you can't spend hours with every patient. There are challenges with how national payment systems are set up and how care is funded. There are organisational processes and structures, for instance, IT, that get in the way. Sometimes leaders don't promote patient-centred care and sometimes the culture doesn't promote it. And actually, sometimes the patient doesn't promote it. So what do you do? And also then, how do you know you're doing it well? I would say that you don't know you're doing it well a lot of the time as a professional because every patient is different. And guess what? They're different on different days as well. So this is not an easy thing um, to, to handle as a, as a healthcare professional. But these are my kind of top tips for you. The first, communication, no surprises there. All those things in slide 12 that I talked about, all those things that make person-centered person care really good, start with communication. I'd say just ask your patients if you're not sure, be humble. It's a skill that needs to be learned like any others. What's important to them that day? Don't make assumptions. There's something really important about humility um, and not just being a doctor and treating disease and conditions. The second one is trust. And I'd say that's even more important now than ever due to working virtually, due to the fear of the pandemic due to not accessing services in the same way. I've recently started a relationship with a, a professional relationship with a um, gynecologist and I'd never met him. And I was being asked to trust his judgment on something, having never spoken to him in person. It's really difficult as a patient to trust healthcare professionals, particularly a patient um, with a long-term condition like me, who's used to building up really strong trusting relationships. And finally, uh, this is a term I really like, individualised empathy. You may have heard your patient's story a million times. You may get tired of hearing each person's particular concerns or life challenges, and you might have life challenges of your own at any one time that you're dealing with. But for that patient, their consultation is probably the biggest thing happening for them that day. They'll watch everything you do, hear everything you say, They'll listen for the pauses and the tone and they'll interpret what it means. So try and appreciate that and tailor your approach to them as Mrs. Smith or Mr. Taylor, not as patient 3546 whose notes you've just pulled out of your drawer. Understand their concerns and respond to them. Don't preempt what you think that they might say and respond to that instead. 
recognize I think that it's really hard because one size doesn't fit all when it comes to person-centered care you might get someone like me who's really interested someone who's articulate or you might get someone who's really anxious someone from a different culture to yourself someone with language differences people who don't care people with a lower IQ uh, which makes it really difficult to engage people with mental health conditions dementia it's really difficult to get it right for everyone and I think also patients have to play their role too you know they need to listen they need to engage with you and communicate and respect you as a professional I think you know it's not great if they expect you to make all the decisions for them if they're ignorant of, of what's going on if they're unrealistic or if they're selfish. And I think for, for you guys as healthcare professionals, be brave in asking patients, families, or their advocates to play a part wherever possible. And my ambition really is to educate patients on the system in which they are advocating. Teach them to understand the importance of patients at large rather than just their own account and give them the skills to advocate with confidence and be heard on an equal footing with others. And I, I guess what I would also say is that patient centred care is really important to me because it allows people to live their life and meet their goals without the need to feel like they're always fighting alone. On the left hand side here, you can see me at university rehearsing for a for a play that I was both in and directing. I was successfully called to the bar in the middle and uh, about 18 months ago, I drove across the Rockies with our adopted son, Dara, who was just one in this photo. So if I take you back to that first slide where I said I wanted to act and be a barrister and travel the world, I've kind of done it. I'll leave you with this as my final video. That's my son, Dara, who sort of completes me. Uh, Anna Edward, and uh, thank you for uh, going across through your own experience and sending us some strong message. And the three most important messages that I could really look at is, number one, communication, trust, and individualized empathy. I think you stressed on that, and your own experience actually makes us believe that you really have gone through a great difficult times, but have come out victorious. And I think we wish you the very best, and I hope you continue to do that. We'll wait for your question and answer session as we go on to the next speaker, Isabella. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's so hard to speak after the amazing Anna Edwards. Thank you so much, Anna, for being so brave and sharing your story with us. Thank you, Anu, for inviting me. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about patient experience and why it matters to me as a person, as a patient myself, and as a provider, as I am a dentist. Well, I am a dentist. I live in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And today I'm going to share with you um, a very special story I have with the most important patient I've met in my career, the one important for, you know, have changed my life completed, completely and made me think about the system of healthcare, the disparities of the system, and how we providers and patients, we are responsible to fix the system and change and lead the change. And patient experience, uh, what's beyond the books? How can storytelling touch people's heart and tell them some lessons? I'm gonna tell you today, Mateus' story. Mateus was a patient that I saw, that I assisted, and Brazilian Air Force uh, in my first years as a dentist. 
I'm gonna share with you the Mecca-Gruber syndrome a little bit, some clinical aspects, subjective aspects, the oral complications the syndrome brings, the journey of Mateus in the hospital and what mattered for him and for his family. Well, the Mecca-Gruber syndrome is a rare lateral autosomical recessive condition mapping to six different loci in different chromosomes. This mapping suggests genetic heterogeneity in Mecca-Gruber syndrome, and more than 20 hundred cases have been reported in literature. The triads of occipital and cephalocell, large polycystic kidneys, and postaxial polydactyly characterize the syndrome. Worldwide, the incidence varies from 30,000, 13,000, sorry, to 100,000. And prenatal ultrasound is currently the best method available to provide the diagnosis. And in this first picture, in this first picture, sorry, you are able to see Mateus right after birth. He was born in the city of Brasilia in a hospital affiliated to the Air Force. And he had this huge encephalocell. And his family already knew that he has the syndrome because he has been diagnosed uh, with an ultrasound. And you know what happened to him after his birth, the delivery? He was left in bed waiting for the death because as I said, uh, it's a very rare disease and also little. His father, who was a very brave man, did not accept this and knock it in every single leader military door to ask that, that they did something for his kids. So after a lot of battles, this was the first battle Mateus faced, they were able to, to get a transfer to Rio de Janeiro, my city, to have the surgical correction of the encephalocell. So Mateus came to Rio de Janeiro to make the correction of the encephalocell. And at this, and at this point is, our, is where our, our lives cross. Mateus got into, the, into my hospital after the correction of the encephalocell and he was in the new NATO intensive care unit. Uh, looking after the complications of the syndrome, he had a tracheostomy, a gastrostomy, and one of the components of the, um, of the syndrome, because Mateus had a lot of seizures every single day. And I was called to make, um, to make a visit to Mateus because he, his mouth could not stop bleeding and his mother had made a complaint, a formal complaint in the, leader, in the leadership room. So I, I, I have to tell you, I was told to go to see Mateus because I was in my first days at the Air Force. So I was like the freshman. It was like a punishment for me to go there and see him. See how the system is. Mateus spent days with pain, with bleeding, and with the mother in suffering, watching to all this until a dentist uh, was able to go there. So the, the case was, uh, at this time, he was 22 months old, male, leucoderma, admitted in the intensive care unit at the Air Force Central Hospital, presented with parked lips, extensive crusts, and significant ulcer, and left lingual edge with about two centimeters of diameter covered with pseudomembrane with swollen heart on palpation over six months of follow irregular margins, according to the mother. He had the medical diagnosis, as I said, of the Mecca-Gruber syndrome with frequent episodes of convulsions. The presumptive diagnosis I provide was a traumatic ulcer, probably caused by the teeth 75 and the 65 to uh, deciduous molars that were under eruption. At this stage of uh, a baby's life, the teeth are under eruption. Um, she re he received a daily dentist monitoring in showing a significant improvement in the oral clinical picture. According to reports of the medical staff and the mother, the patient got calmer and happier with less frequent interventions of medical urgencies. So what mattered to this mother was much more than to have, you know, uh, a good care of the clinical disease, but also... Uh, to look at the mouth, mouth is part of the body and was impacting a lot to see every day in the morning, the pillow full 
of blood and the aspect, the face of pain. So it took to this mother a lot of time to have her rights assured. And this was the second battle in Mateo's journey. And with this story, we can get some lessons from him and his family. It's my right to receive the equality care. You know, you are not making any favor to me. If I am here in this hospital and I, ha I have this insurance, it's my right to receive a quality care. It's my right to be treated with respect and dignity. I don't mind if I have a little and rare syndrome. If I am here, if I am alive today, please treat me with respect. My caregivers are a vital part of my journey. Sometimes we make a mistake uh, and some confusion uh, mixing terminologies like patient experience and caregiver experience, family experience. Patient experience is relating to the patient and caregiver is related to the family or to the person the family chooses to be their caregiver. And one differs from the other and one impacts uh, on the other a lot. If you can do something better for me, please go ahead, break the rules. Listen to me and to my caregivers. What is important to me at this moment? I don't mind if you give me, if you already gave me everything that was possible, but if I am feeling pain in my mouth, please send me a dentist to see me. For you, it's just another shift, another disease, but for me, it's my life. Thank you for connecting with me. Person in the center. What is person in the center? Sorry, I see a lot of organizations, no matter if they are military, private, or public, saying that they provide person in the center. But as we see, as and we go deep and see how it happens, it's not that person in the center. It's more centered in the disease and centered in the physician. And uh, it's we, as Anna said in the presentation, we have to allow patients and persons to say what's important for them and for their caregivers so that they have a better experience and a better journey. Can you see in this picture the satisfaction of this mother after our connection and after the time he got treated? And a closer look at what Mateus has done. First, to me, Mateus made me shift from a regular dentist, a pediatric dentist, to a global advocate. Mateus made me realize that the system was not designed for the ones who really need a better care. The system is designed to dehumanize patients. And although I had at that time already a lifelong experience with disease as I have a sister with cerebral palsy. I was the caregiver of my mother with depression and bipolar disorder. Nothing, nothing has ever touched my heart so deeply as the expression of that mother when I first got into the intensive care unit and saw them in suffering holding her son. And by that time, I decided that I should practice another dentist. I should go with another look to the healthcare system and do what the healthcare system needs to do. So I was uh, studying for this presentation yesterday and I stalked myself to create this slide. And I had no idea of everything I have done. So this is not something, you know, I was not responsible for that, but I think Mateus and his family, they were responsible for making me, you know, to transform me like that. And to the system, Mateus was able to change the system. Uh, at that time, we, we did not have the sector of special care, home care, hospital dentistry. So um, Mateus was able to transform everything and the sectors were created like special care dentistry, home care sector, hospital dentistry, uh, geriatric dentistry. So after Mateo's experience in the hospital, everybody was touched and now we are not doing right over here. Let's change things. So when you think about a story like this and when you look at the system, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. 
if you are not satisfied with the results you are getting, you, you can't blame people. You can't judge or punish your team. And you cannot expect that patients will transform things if you don't have a system that allows you to. And talking about system, let me invite you a little bit for a reflection. Let's uh, imagine a hypothetical situation here. What if you were in prison? What is the first thing you would need to know if you were in prison? Everybody says, and when I present this, everybody says, where is the key? And other says, where is the exit? No, folks. The first thing you need to know is you are in prison. You are locked in a system that dehumanizes patients and families. You are locked in a system that is shaped and designed to physicians. You should break the rules and make the change. And system is designed to make you feel, to make you give up. No, not you, not us. We will never give up. Uh, my presentation is about to end. Uh, this is the Saint Benazer Bridge or Avignon Bridge. It would link Avignon to Chateau du Pep in France. From one side you have the grapes, in the other you have the wines. Uh, it was built in uh, 177 and 185 on the Road River. Uh, the point, uh, the bridge Saint Benazet or Bridge d'Avignon was of great convenience for pilgrims and merchants who traveled between Spain and Italy. It was the only way to get to the sea from Lyon. In the beginning, the point of Saint Benazet had 22 arcs, but it was several times ruined by floods and rebuilt until the 17th century. After that date, the bridge was no longer restored because of the costings and nobody was able to, to you know, to, to restore the air calls anymore. And I make a metaphorical comparison with, I think from one side, we have the patients and the caregivers and the families and the other side, we have the system and the healthcare professional. Who is going to rebuild the air calls today? The physicians, the workforce, the patients, the families, I think the Arcos will only be able to be restored and we, in the creation of a better healthcare system will only be possible if we all get together to rebuild these Arcos. Thank you so much. Uh, Isabella, that was a fantastic uh, presentation and more important than that. I think like the way you put it up, uh, okay, fighting for the person who deserves to be actually recognized. And I think I come from a background of a healthcare worker who probably does not recognize the fact there is an entity on the other side who also needs to be actually taken care of. And I think uh, what you rightly said was the right of the patients. As much as we keep on talking, I think give them respect and dignity. Two important things that you vouched for, and I think I'm very much for it, and I think we are losing the battle because at one point of time, the health care workers, because of the huge population, they don't feel they have the enough time to spend along with the patient. And the other type, the patients and their families, perhaps because of the Google, they have come up with so many strong questions that sometimes the health care providers are very find it difficult to actually answer. But I think... We need to fix the system without a doubt. There is no question about it. We need to improve our system, need to fix the system. And for that, perhaps we need to change the system. And if that happens, the bridge has to be restored, come what may. We have no choices at all. Somewhere we'll have to come midway and accept the fact that the two are the two pillars are very important and we need to cross the bridge some way or the other. Otherwise, I think the healthcare is going to suffer largely because of that. And I rightly said, that is all personal experience, which are far, far beyond the books. I think everyone's personal experience, whether it is Anna, through our own experience, or Isabella, through the experience of one person, have changed their whole life and all changed the history of the way they look at things and become a very strong advocate of 
what is patient's right and how dignified the patient should be given the due respect. I think I'm amazed. I, I think I was very fascinated by uh, Anna Edwards' whole story, you know, uh, going through the multiple trauma in life and still smiling out through it is actually phenomenal. And I think hats off to her and my sh respects to her because I think she went through an experience which not many people would even think about, you know. A barrister going on to fighting for the patient's needs because of her own experience is fantastic, absolutely. And to this uh, lady, uh, Isabella Castro, really, really very nice. I mean, a person who starts in Air Force the first day, and I think it always happens in uh, medical sciences, the youngest of the lot gets the most battering. But I think that is also an experience that we all learn. I think over a period of time, we become better and better because the battering that has been given by seniors as we go up the ladder. And I think the whole thing system again repeats itself. So somewhere down the line, I have a feeling, but I think it's very, very important that we should respect every healthcare worker. But more important, I think we keep on missing the point, the patient and the patient family. I think these two persons are the most important. If they don't exist, I think the whole healthcare world doesn't exist. So where are we talking about? And I think if at all we don't respect them, I think we, there is no place that we should be respected at all. A few questions coming in uh, from uh, Akio Irata. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. How would you encourage patients to speak up their thoughts? What is the first step for that would be? Would you have any educational program for medical professional doing so? Anna? Actually, it's not, it's not that straightforward. It's a cultural shift. And that's a cultural shift that, that needs to happen across the world, right? And it, we're all at different stages in this. Um, but I said in my presentation that, it, that it's about kind of educating patients as to what role they can play. And I think the things around us will enable that. So we've got a lot more tech that helps now we've got access to google we've got access to all these things and it just informs us as patients you know of the things that we should expect and that will help but i think we need to empower patients too so and they won't do that on their own you know i can't get to every person in the world and teach them how to be an empowered patient and neither can my colleagues who work across the sort of patient-centered care um, landscape but there are doctors on every corner of every street who can do that encouragement uh, and create a conversation that empowers patients. You certainly won't empower them if you if you stop them in their tracks. So I, I would say it's a joint responsibility, actually. OK, uh, uh, Isabella, I have got a question for you from uh, Leah Sema. What is the difference between patient satisfaction and experience? I think patient satisfaction, it's uh, much more related to the expectation patient have about uh, the journey he's about to have. So it, it varies a lot in which part of the journey you are. So if you are in the emergency room, you are afraid to die and you are feeling that bad, you are afraid to die, your expectation is to survive. So if you survive, you have your expectations attended. So you are having a good satisfaction so far. <laughs> and then they move you to, to a bed to balance you and prepare you for discharge. So your satisfaction is be able to breathe, is be able to go to the restroom, be able to eat and be able to maintain your parameters, the clinical parameters so that you are able to discharge. So again, it's about uh, uh, your expectations. If in Brazil, for example, there is a lot of difference between private and public hospitals. And if you've never tried a private hospital before and you always tested, use it, the public, you will certainly be beaten by the experience in the private because it's better, not in terms just in, I'm not telling about the treatment, but I'm the structure, physical structure. You'll be, the patient will be very impressive with that. So it depends a lot on the expectations you have and from your personal, from a previous experience with the system. So 
patient experience is related to every single touch the patient has during the journey. And it goes beyond the contact with the physician, the contact with the nurse. It's about noises. It's about conversations they can, they are able to listen on the, uh, uh, during, uh, uh, in the corridor from workforce, etc. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Sorry about my English. Your English is good, don't worry, absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's one more question. I think I'd leave it to Anna to answer this. Uh, I think she talks uh, uh, in with great pride about both Anna and uh, uh, Isabella. They have shared their experience, but they're very strong, empowering women. How is this applicable to normal staff when dealing with patients, especially in this time where there's less of human touch because of the distance? Yeah. Any takers? Yeah. Uh, uh, and I am. I completely understand that. And I, and I have to say, I I've always been quite a strong woman, even before I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. It's something that I take from my grandparents and um, and others in the family. So I think it's a really good question. I I think my advice would be. And, it, and this is just from my perspective as a patient. And remember, I've been a patient alongside others who are quieter, who are less educated. And, and you know, I've seen, I've sat in a hospital bed and watched doctors treat every person in that ward in a different way based on their perceptions of what that person is, their background, their, their kind of character. When they come to me as a barrister who works in healthcare regulation, they're very keen to talk to me, but I've seen that that is not the same for everyone. So the, the, I, would, I guess I'd say four things. The first is to listen to them and actively listen and don't just, don't just think, you know, I've got to get on to the next person. Let them realize you're listening to them. It needs to be authentic, okay? That's number one. Number two, respect them regardless of their background doesn't matter where they come from how much money they've got whether they're a man or a woman what their culture is their color is whatever it is their caste whatever you know you must respect that person they're they're not in a position of power here they respect their journey and why they're there the third the third thing is about open questions uh, i used to deal with a lot of vulnerable children as a barrister um, and I needed to elicit information from them. So it was always open questions, in a very calm and understanding way. Now that way you'll, you'll really be able to build that trust and respect. And the fourth point I think is about taking your time. Um, you know, not, not everyone on your list that day is gonna need the same amount of time, but some will. So I guess it's about getting that balance between the people you can see and consult with in a couple of minutes and then those that are going to take 20 minutes. And I, and I have to tell you, when I was diagnosed by my general practitioner with Crohn's disease, uh, I think that day he had a packed waiting room and he spent about an hour and a half with me, an hour and a half. And in England, time really is about eight minutes generally with each person. We took the time because I needed it that day and I've never forgotten it and it was 20 plus years ago. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, rightly said that the art of listening is an art getting lost very soon. And it is said that in an average time uh, when a patient speaks and a doctor listens, the doctor starts uh, interrupting the patient's conversation less than one and a half minutes, okay. So uh, that's where the barrier is all about. And I, I think uh, uh, time difference has come in where uh, each one wants to finish off his uh, part as soon as possible and go to the next patient. So that, uh, that's something that we need to learn as healthcare workers. Absolutely, we need to give the time to them. Uh, there's one more question, which is the, probably the last question that I could ask. What is the role of hospital administrat uh, administrator in a patient-centered care? Isabella, you would like, or Anna, you, uh, anyone? I, more than ever in this new existing times with co all the challenges that COVID has brought, there is no way to deal with a business case in healthcare for institutions 
if you don't have transparency. So if you want, you know, when you imagine a bad system, a bad system can beat even a champion workforce. So it has, it has to be in the strategy. Person-centered care, it has to be linked in the business case. You need to have data related to that. You have, you know, you have to see data over time to prove the others that person-centered care is good for patients, good for community. It allows partnership, allows growing and also save money. It's uh, not just, you know, cause I see a lot in Brazil that people put in the website and then in the conference room, it's the one subject, but in the real world at the bad site is where the war happens. That's not what happens because the system is not designed for that. So you cannot tell your, your workforce do that if you don't have a system that allows them to do or allows due to a lot of burnout and a lot of exhausted so I think it has to be in the strategy, you know, when designing the strategy, you be sure that you have that commitment, you know, a, a real commitment and a transparency in terms of a real design, a, a real desire to change. And, you know, we are not going to change the world, will we? Maybe, I, I do believe. But this concept of institution as a local business, which is responsible but a lot of stuff around. So if you do what is right in your local community, you probably will trigger some small, small spreads and the new ones will do like this, like this, like this, and it has no end, the impact of that. So uh, uh, I think uh, coming from two beautiful, strong ladies who actually are looking out for patient-centered care. And I think I strongly believe at this point of a career, after going 35 years, I also believe that the person who actually should, who should have been given the most, uh, greatest importance has been given the least of the lot. Uh, somewhere down the line, the system has failed. And as the system becomes more and more business oriented, the service part is actually missed out. And so that's the reason and we need to change. And I think Someone needs to start, and I think I'm very, very happy that two strong ladies are making this change. And I think we should be all a part of the change. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Isabella, for your great talk, and nice seeing you both. Uh, we wish you the very best in whatever we are doing it. And someday when you require us, call us, and we'll be there with you, help, trying to help you out. Over to Anuradha and Lalu to take it forward. Thank you very much, uh... Dr. Naresh Shetty, Anna Edwards, Isabel Castro. It's been a great experience listening to both the ladies and wonderful moderation by Dr. Naresh Shetty. Uh, I would now like to request Dr. Ravidran Jagasothi to honor the speakers for the wonderful session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lalu. I think uh, all doctors will remember that we would not be here if not for the patients. And I think today we listened to two powerful presentations uh, from the own personal experience, how we can make the system better. I think there were a lot of valuable lessons. It was my pleasure to witness this and learn from it as well. And uh, especially uh, in the presence of Dr. Carsten Angel, who is now taking on the East Coast in New York. So it's my pleasure now to award two certificates to Ms. Anna Edwards, and for your presentation, and also to Miss uh, Isabella Castro for your presentation. Please accept this on behalf of KO and his squad. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. And spending with us, really appreciate. Thank you very much, dear friends, for taking the time and for joining us. We welcome you, Dr. Carsten, and really appreciate taking the time and spending this with us. Appreciate all the speakers, Dr. Naresh Shetty, Dr. Ravindran Jagasothi, and uh, Dr. Anuradha Pichimani, and all the participants from across the globe.